It is now my privilege to introduce Independent Sector's President and CEO, Dr. Akila Watkins. Akila? Thank you, Monka. Really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Akila Watkins, Independent Sector's President and CEO. This is our first member exclusive workforce development event intended to help you lead through challenge. And I'm so happy that you have joined us here today. Our members are truly at the core of the work we do. And if you have a role in management at your organization, particularly, you'll find today's webinar to be most beneficial. I wanna start by respectfully acknowledging that I'm joining you today from Washington, D.C., ancestral home of the Nakachtank, Anacostan, and Piscataway peoples who continue to live in the area and are working to reclaim their land and traditional practices. I also wanna acknowledge that many of the buildings and places we inhibit in Washington, D.C. were built with the labor of enslaved people. And of course, I wanna thank Brevity and Wit for partnering with us to host this important discussion today. You know, over the past year, Independent Sector conducted a listening tour across the country. On this tour, I spoke to more than 500 nonprofit and philanthropic change makers like yourself. As IES's new president and CEO, I wanted to get, get your feedback about opportunities, trends, and challenges facing the nonprofit sector. I can tell you that just about everywhere we visited, I heard there were significant workforce challenges in our sector as the nature of the work itself evolves. Understanding the needs of and opportunities for the nonprofit and philanthropic workforce is only one of my priorities in independent sector. Amid rising costs, political polarization, election uncertainties, and a backlash against diversity efforts, we know that many nonprofit leaders like yourself are struggling to navigate an increasingly challenging year. Data from the Trust in Nonprofits and, and Philanthropy Report released just this week and available on the Independent Sector website tells us that trust in nonprofits has increased, while trust in other sectors such as government, business, and media has declined. The report also provides insight into how nonprofits and foundations can manage and enhance trust in an environment of social division, political polarization, and low trust in advocacy and civic engagement. It's more important than ever that you have strategies and tools to help you lead inclusively and effectively during these times. Our intention today is for you to leave here with practical information and resources you can apply in your, work for, in your workplace. Now, I am pleased to introduce you to our featured speaker, Manal Bul, um, excuse me, Manal Bulpaya. Manal is an award-winning author, keynote speaker, equity strategist. She founded Brevity and Wit, a strategy and design firm that helps organizations achieve the change they want to see in the world. Her first book, Equity, how to Design Organizations Where Everyone Thrives was awarded the 2022 Terry McAdam Book Award for the book most likely to change the way nonprofit professionals work. She is happiest when sharing her infectious enthusiasm for diversity, equity, and inclusion with audiences around the world. I'll turn it over to you, Manal, to guide us through the session. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. Hello, everyone. Hi, Independent Sector members. It's wonderful to be here with you today. I want to thank Independent Sector for inviting me to speak with you all. They are a wonderful group, and it's been such a pleasure working with them. Because uh, we are on, you know, I don't want to uh, waste your time since you're giving me time in the middle of your day. I want to just set, let's get started and set some expectations for what we're going to do in the next 55 minutes. Uh, as Monka said, this session is being recorded and you'll get a copy of the deck. Uh, and I'm gonna ask you all to be curious about what I'm gonna present, not judgmental if you're a fan of Walt Whitman or Ted Lasso. I'm gonna ask, uh, you can feel free to ask topical questions when I'm going through the presentation. You can put them in the chat, you can put them in the Q&A. 
if your question is a little bit tangential to the topic that I'm covering, save it for later. And we're going to have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. And finally, I want to say that it's okay to have fun. Uh, I know that sometimes, so I'm a DEI practitioner. I am a leadership development specialist, uh, the founder of Brevity and Wit. And I know sometimes when we talk about DEI, people feel that they are more serious about it if they're very dour. I don't believe that. I think it's okay to have fun and laugh. Uh, and I want to invite you all to at least take an hour break from your busy work days and allow yourself to enjoy this uh, webinar as well. So let's start with the truth. And that is leadership has always been hard and now it is harder, right? Uh, the demands being put on leadership right now are, are significant. Some of that is because of external forces, uh, a very polarized uh, world in terms of either politics or belief, economic hardship, uh, changes to laws about how we can do our work as nonprofits. Some of that is internal, staff having different expectations, often across generational divides, but often across other identities as well. Um, and, you know, trying to find a way to work sustainably in either in a, a remote or a hybrid environment. So take the time to acknowledge that your jobs are hard. I know that as leaders, it can be very lonely. And I'm here to tell you that you're not alone in acknowledging the, you know, the emotional weight of what you carry. With that in mind, I wanted to share this quote from Admiral Stockdale. For those of you who are familiar with the Stockdale paradox, this is often, I think, one of the best um, <clears throat> guiding lights for leaders for what to do when circumstances are hard. And before I read the quote, I'll just give a little bit of backstory about uh, Admiral Stockdale for those who don't know. Uh, Jim Stockdale was captured as a POW, I believe, during the Vietnam War, and he was imprisoned with other POWs, and um, he th they were there for years, and he helped lead a group that finally were able to get out. And Jim Collins, in his book, Good to Great, interviews Admiral Stockdale and asks him, who were the people who didn't make it out? And Admiral Stockdale was quick to answer, oh, that's easy, it was the optimists which took Jim Collins aback for a second. And uh, Admiral Stockdale explained, he said, you know, the optimists set these unrealistic expectations based on no information or data or, you know, intel whatsoever that they would be freed by Christmas or they would be freed by Easter. And then Christmas would come and go or Easter would come and go and they would still be imprisoned. And basically Jim Stockdale said that they died of a broken heart. The people who and and you know the people who made it out were the people who were willing to confront the brutal facts of their reality, and this is what this quote is in about: that you must maintain unwavering faith that you can and will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties, and at the same time have the discipline and I would add the courage to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Right. This. Quote, this paradox, I think, is the most apt for the times in which we are all leading right now. It can look bleak out there, and you must be able to admit to it, and you must have unwavering faith that we will prevent, right? And the other thing that uh, Jim Stockdale talks about, or I'm sorry, the other thing Jim Collins talks about in that book is that great leaders tell the truth and then give people hope. It's both. It's not simply telling the truth and being a misanthrope, and it's not simply being optimistic and dealing in hope without, without any truth telling. You have to do both. Now, telling the truth is obviously um, one of the nonprofit's sector's fortes. Public trust is a currency of the nonprofit sector as independent sectors trust in civil society reports. But more importantly, nonprofits have like the the most amount of trust of institutions in our in the United States, at least, and possibly globally. Um, it's higher for smaller nonprofits, and political polarization definitely shades people's perceptions of trust of, of such nonprofits. Um, but what's also really important is that communications that emphasize values help move the needle to get people to either trust the nonprofit more or to act in a way that's in accordance with the nonprofit's mission. And we're gonna spend some time talking about values-based communications today. 
now, um, oh, and the other thing was that um, the, um, the, the most recent report by independent sector also saw that there was an increase in trust for nonprofits, a five percentage point increase, which is great. Um, and Edelman did this other study in 2022 that found that while trust in institutions or in, in a lot of institutions may be declining, people generally trusted their CEO. So this is so on top of having high trust in the nonprofit sector, you all have the staff who are going to trust you more than they are going to trust outside sources. And that's something to leverage. The reason we want to build trust is because trust is how, um, you know, change moves at the speed of trust fundamentally, right? If we want to change things, we need to get people to trust us and each other more. So the question then becomes for leaders, if you are intent on realizing the impact you want to see, the change you want to see in the world, your job is to think and act strategically to build trust so you can lead well. That is the secret to leading in polarizing times, right? And so there are three trust building behaviors that we're gonna talk about today. The first is values-based communications. The second is being transparent, but also boundaried. And we'll talk about what that means. And then the third is to use your power and your identity wisely, okay? So, Values-based communications. Why do I emphasize values-based communication? So there's a lot of myths about comms. People like to say, well, data changes people's mind. Data doesn't change behavior. Um, if it did, we wouldn't be arguing about climate change. Uh, I often say that if data and information was enough to change behavior, everyone would floss every day and exercise three times a week and not have any credit card debt. And if you are one of the superhumans who does all three of those things, please put your name in the chat so I can congratulate you because <laughs> whenever I give this presentation, there's like one or two people who, you know, can do all three of those things. And then the rest of us have to hack our brains, right? Because data and information is not enough. Storytelling can be powerful, but it can also go either way. And what I mean by that is some of the best storytellers in history have also been fascists like Hitler, have also been demagogues, have also been people who have abused their power and used it to oppress people. So um, people who are interested in countering fascism, yes, they need to tell better stories, but just telling a story uh, doesn't allow you much control on what people's lesson is gonna be on that, unless you're very strategic about that, and it can go either way. What really works, and this is what the Trust in Civil Society report found, was speaking to people's values, because when you speak to people's values, you can align a group to move in the same direction, right? Um, there's a lot of speed in our world, but we're all moving in different directions. When you have speed and direction, you get velocity, right? That's what, like, you need the directional part of your uh, work in order to really have impact. So when we say that it, you need to speak to people's values, uh, I always include a table of common values. These are not exhaustive. Uh, I actually don't think equity is on there, and that's clearly one of mine since I wrote a book of the name. But it gives you a sense of the diversity of values that people can hold. Now, it's really important when you're doing values-based communication that you understand that your job is not to change people's values. It is very, very hard to change people's values, and I would caution against it. Instead, it is easier to um, show how your values map onto somebody else's, right? So what do I mean by that? When I was doing a workshop on communications with two DEI practitioners, they talked about trying to get their CEO on board with their DEI work by um, talking about disruption. Like we gotta disrupt things, we gotta disrupt things. And I said, well, what is your, C what is your CEO value? What's his core value? And they said, harmony. And I was like, well, then stop talking about disruption. You're not going to get to change, like, you're not going to be able to change his core value from harmony all the way to disruption. 
What you can do is show how DEI work, the thing you care about, maps onto his value of harmony. Because DEI, when done well, allows you to surface conflict and to have a genuine sense of harmony instead of an inauthentic sense of harmony in an organization, right? Uh, another example might be climate change. So if Greenpeace came to me and said, you need to care about climate change and here's all these reports that tell you why you need to care about it, I'd be like, okay, but I'm working on like this equity and like stuff over here. And I'm reading a lot of data about that. I don't really have time to go and read all your data reports on climate change. If they said to me though, yes, but because of climate change, people of color are the most likely to be impacted and harmed by climate change, then they've got me, right? Because they have shown how what they care about maps onto what my core value is. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about values-based communication is knowing the values of your audience and showing how your work maps onto them. For a leader, that means knowing the values of your staff and showing how whatever strategic direction you want to lead them in maps onto their values. And so an example of that is this message box that I created for a leader who is having problem with, with her senior leadership team who didn't want to engage in any DEI work, any leadership training or leadership development. They were really resistant to change. Um, now, there's a lot of behavioral science that goes into creating a message box like this. And chapter five of my book is dedicated entirely to communications and explaining how to fill out something like this. But I'm going to take you through it very quickly just to get a sense of what values-based communication looks like and feels like. So the audience, so the speaker was the CEO and the audience was her senior leadership team. And what she wanted them to do was engage in leadership trainings. Once you identify what you want people to do, the second thing you need to do is identify the barrier. What is the barrier to getting them to engage in leadership trainings? They're really resistant to change, okay? But I asked her, what did they value? And she was like, they valued being the best. This is a, a nonprofit that had won a lot of awards and we're really proud of it. So we crafted this message where we said that like, we invoke that value. We are all committed to being the best non-profit nonprofit professionals we can be. We all want to serve the mission and achieve impact. And then we had a message that broke through their resistance that said, for decades, we've pursued excellence in our work and our service to our beneficiaries, but not in our leadership skills. We're not alone in this. Many nonprofits have also neglected leadership development. However, in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, a lack of solid leadership skills, which are far more durable than the perishable skills of technical knowledge, will lead to poor quality work, harmful impact, declining donor bases, and eventually closing our doors. So I'm asking you to engage in our leadership training so you can learn the skills to be a 21st century leader and have a long career in our sector, right? That's how you move people with values-based communication. I'm gonna pause before, feel free to put questions in the chat if you have any. Uh, we're gonna cover a lot and I have linked to a lot of resources so that you can start to, after this presentation, you can deep dive into the parts that most resonate with the challenges that you're facing as a leader. But let us move on in the interest of time to number two, which is to be transparent. So this is an article from Greater Good Magazine, which I particularly like, that says that um, if you want to lead, you know, how to, I, well, I love the title, how to lead when everyone's mad at you, which I feel a lot of leaders could resonate with, right? Like that. Um, and um, what, what it advises is basically three things. Let them see you sweat, right? Like show them that you're struggling too, right? Like they might be mad at you, but it's not like you're taking it easy and just okay with everybody being mad at you, right? It's not like you've got your feet up on the desk. You're like hustling to like make change as well. And you're trying to do what's in the best interest of them and the organization. Two, protect your sanity. One of the biggest impediments to any sort of change effort, particularly within organizations, is uh, leaders who are emotionally dysregulated. If you cannot regulate yourself, if you cannot find a way to return to a calm state and to some semblance of peace of mind every day, then you are not going to be effective as a leader. 
So you got to create the boundaries and the mechanisms to protect your sanity. And third, hold a dress rehearsal is basically about practicing what you want to say, getting some test audiences, getting some people you trust in your organization to run messaging by um, and, and to run decisions by so that you are sure that you're acting in the best interest of the organizations. Now, transparency fosters trust, right? Fundamentally, people can understand that. Uh, Brene Brown likes to say clear is kind and unclear is unkind, which is very true in communications. You should be as clear as possible. However, um, oh, and I'm sorry, part of being, you know, clear and part of fostering trust, um, you know, Brene Brown also has this workshop called, uh, this worksheet that we've created called uh, the anatomy of, she calls it the anatomy of trust. We have taken her work and we have a downloadable worksheet on this that allows you to rate yourself and your team on these values that are known to foster trust. If you see, if you read this, you'll see that the first one is boundaries. Making clear what's okay and what's not okay, what's possible and what's not possible. That's really important, particularly when we're talking about transparency. Because the other research around transparency has found that transparency needs boundaries in order to foster trust. Zones of privacy are also needed to foster trust. I wrote this article, um, like what transparency and accountability looks like in organizations. And let me see if I can also get you the link while I'm talking about it. Um, or actually, no, I'm sorry, it'll, it'll be in the, in the slide deck. These words, transparency and accountability, are used a lot by both staff and leaders, but I don't think that very often there is not a shared understanding of what these words mean. And this article was meant to fundamentally flesh out for everyone what we mean by these words. Transparency doesn't mean you tell everybody everything. And in the article, I have a list of things that are transparent behaviors, like the organization is clear and truthful about how decisions are going to be made. And I have a list of behaviors that are not transparent, that are not about transparency and instead are boundary crossing, such as colleagues pressuring one another to share personal details, such as their feelings, their pronouns, sexuality, marital status, disability status, religion, political views, et cetera, right? Um, outing people is not how you foster trust in an organization. Um, speaking about why you had to fire someone to, uh, and telling the entire staff is not how you foster trust in an organization. And it's you can tell the staff, I'm not going to talk about that because that would be a violation of both, you know, I think the law, but also it would be a, a, a inappropriate use of our power to speak publicly about one employee, and we would never do that to any of you. And those things have to be made clear because people are throwing around these words without a full understanding of um, the boundaries that need to be around transparency. Now, I put in, you know, the organization is clear and truthful about how decisions are going to be made because that's often another conundrum we see in organizations when they are trying to lead through polarizing times. Uh, and particularly when they try to engage in DEI work, I think there is a, a myth that inclusion um, means everyone's going to be involved in everything or that equity means everybody gets a vote in everything. And fundamentally, you can't run an organization that way, right? Uh, and one of the reasons, um, and this is a chart, the inclusive decision-making framework created by the Conscious Leadership Group. One of the reasons is because if you want to get consensus or everybody aligned, it actually takes more time. It takes a lot more time. And you often don't have that much time, particularly in the nonprofit sector. Um, it does allow you to get more buy-in, but it requires a lot of time to get there. Uh, another reason why you don't want to lead by consensus is because what I have started to see is um, this idea, like, it, it, it becomes a way to undermine people of color and women when they hit leadership positions. You often have, when somebody of a identity that has been historically absent in leadership hits a leadership position, that doesn't mean that you know they stop experiencing microaggressions just because they're in a position of power. 
they can still experience microaggressions. And one of the ways that can happen is people who have historically had power in the organization saying things like, well, you didn't include me in that decision. But the fact of the matter is that person was promoted to that position because they were trusted to make good judgment. They should be allowed the right to exercise their authority. And then they should be held accountable for their decision. You know, when organizations run in a way that like the staff decides like what are the you know revenue goals my question is if you don't meet those revenue goals is the staff going to hold themselves accountable or is it the person in charge of revenue who gets held accountable right so when you have situations like that you want to probably make the decision um either the leader makes it with input from people or a subgroup or a subcommittee makes that decision right and then it's also really clear who is being held accountable for the outcome of that decision. So this is really important, but the, the, the really important part too is that you want to socialize this, uh, talk about how the decision is gonna be made before you start to engage in the process and before you make the decision. That's how you foster trust. You don't foster trust by promising that everybody's gonna be involved in every decision because you fundamentally probably won't be able to deliver on that. You foster trust by being upfront um, about how the decision is going to be made by either saying, this is my decision, I'm going to make this decision with input, this is a decision for a committee that we're going to appoint, this is a decision that we're all going to um, vote on and the majority will have the deciding uh, vote, or we're going to spend the time going to consensus and alignment around this decision. Say that up front and you will get far more trust in your organization. I'm going to check the q a i saw somebody asked about um resistance to change so i'm going to answer that at the end because we're just, i kind of moved on um but thank you and I, I promise i'll get back to that so number three for how to build trust and lead well during polarizing times is to use your power wisely now we all have power, but not the same amount of power, and it's not allocated equally. Um, when I talk about power, power is a very like radioactive word, right? And when I talk about it, most people's experience of power is uh, the Machiavellian approach, like abuses of power. People are very powerful, but they use it in really poor ways, right? And I think some people in an effort not to align with that, start engaging in this sort of myth making in that like we but we all have power and we're all empowered now we all do have power but if you're the ceo of an organization you have a different type of power and a different amount of power than your staff and you have to be able to tell the truth about it um in addition you have social power which is contingent on how you are perceived which is not always your real identity right so what do I mean by that? Um, this is a group identity wheel that is available, uh, that I use in our work, that's available in the book, that's available as like a free downloadable resource on the book website, which is theequitybook.com. And it was created by uh, my friends Sukari Panak Fitz and Amber Mays of Fifth Domain Coaching. And it helps people understand themselves through an intersectional lens. Because all of us individuals, we have our individual identity, but then we also have, belong to different groups, right? And these are just some of the groups we could belong to, um, you know, based on our gender identity, our culture or our ethnicity, our race, our sexual orientation, our age. There's also groups that I haven't put in, you know, identity groups I haven't put in here, like marital status or um, caregiver status, right? Uh, we we all belong to different groups, and so. This is how I filled mine out like four years ago when I was younger. Um, and, you know, some of those identities that we have are been historically centered and some have been historically marginalized. So as you go through this and you were to name, you know, how you identify for each of these identities, um, you would then check whether historically centered, whether they've been historically centered or historically marginalized. Now, it's not as easy as that, though, because if you see, I put cisgender female. Being a woman has been marginalized, but being cisgender has been 
historically centered, right? So even within this, there's some nuance and complexity. The point of this exercise is not to put yourself in a box. It's to understand yourself through a group identity lens so that you begin to understand how people of other identities may see you. So for example, I put that I'm South Asian or Brown, uh, but, um, you know, I remember there was an experience in when I was in, I think it was the Minnesota airport in Minneapolis, where a waiter refused to serve me. And I'm pretty sure uh, because there's a decent Muslim population up there that they thought that I was Muslim. Now I'm not, that's not my religion, but because I'm brown and a woman, that may be how I perceived. So the power that society allocates to me is sometimes based on how I'm perceived rather than what I am. Uh, this can be the same for people of mixed race identities who are coded as white, right? They get to pass as white and society gives them a different amount of privilege uh, than it may give their siblings who are of a darker skin color. And that's important to know because your staff is, part of being a leader is managing perception. And you have to be aware of how you are perceived by your staff and by the larger audience that your nonprofit is engaging with in order to use that power wisely. When people go through this group identity exercise, they, you know, the, the parts that are colored in, what I do is I ask them, um, after you name all your different identities, which are the ones that are most salient to you as you go through your day? Which are the ones that you're most aware of as you go through your day? And often it will be the ones in, in which people feel marginalized, right? That makes sense from a neurological standpoint, because if you are mar if you if you are part of an identity that's historically marginalized, what we're saying is you have an identity that society tends to push to the margins, and therefore you have less power in society. When you have less power, your brain works over time to figure out who is a friend or foe, right? So you the fact that, like I'm a woman, Growing up in New York, like just walking the street in broad daylight meant I had to be attuned to how I might be attacked because I'm a woman, right? What the identities that people tend to not think about that are not that salient and core to them are the ones in which they've been historically centered, like being heterosexual for me, right? What happens is that sometimes people from marginalized identities, and, and most of us have some marginalized identities, occasionally you run into a person who has none, but that's rare, right? Um, we, because we identify so strongly with that marginalized identity, we're a bit oblivious to the ways in which we hold privilege and power. But if you wanna lead well, you have to get very conscious of how you hold privilege and power, right? And, for nonprofits, they have to think strategically about how to use somebody's intersectional identity. So what I mean by that is um, there was a nonprofit in Maine where I spoke with their executive director who was a black woman who had just recently ascended to their executive directorship. Previous to her, there was a uh, white guy who was the executive director and he had gone out very strongly in favor of um, public housing measures and trying to really adjust, uh, address the, the lack of affordable housing, particularly for people of color in Maine. The board then expected their new executive director, who was a black woman, to carry on this message. And so she did, and she received death threats when she did. The white guy, when he said this, he did not receive death threats, right? And the difference is, basically just her identity, that she was a woman of color and society thinks that they can get away with certain things when you're a woman of color. And in my opinion, the board should have done a better job of protecting her and understanding that fundamentally when it comes to communications, the messenger matters. And there are things that white men say that I cannot say. And there are things that I can say as a woman of color that white men cannot say. 
Uh, there are things that I can say as a heterosexual person that gay people may have a hard time saying. There are things that gay and trans people can say that I cannot say, right? Uh, and so in leadership, as a leader, you have to think about how your identity is going to, what sort of color lens that's going to be put, that's going to put on the message your organization is trying to get out there. And if you really want to be a superhero of a leader, you have to be willing to step down when you may not be the most effective person to del deliver that message, right? Now, I don't mean step down from a CEO or an executive director position. I mean, being willing to say, yeah, you know what? I'm not the best person to speak on that panel. Let's send our COO instead, or let's send our board member who's of a different identity to deliver that message to that audience, right? You got to be willing to strategically engage people in service of the mission uh, in order to get these messages across to different audiences. Finally, and, and that speaks to how you use your power, right? So you, like, as an individual, you have ways in which you are powerful and ways in which you are not. Um, and you can have different types of power, right? You can have I, the power based on your identity. You can have positional power. You can have personal power, like how charming you may be, right? All of those ways of power, like types of power, basically all of them can be used in one of two ways. You can use it in a supremacist or an unethical way, which is taking more than one share and using your power to oppress, dominate, exclude, extract, exploit, divide, and conquer, right? Or you can use your power in a liberatory manner or in a more ethical way, which is viewing differences as strengths, right? The fact that you have different people of different identities on your senior leadership team can be a strength, entertaining interdependence, and then using your power to connect, heal, and repair your organization, our society, and to empower all members of a community. Right. I often say that this slide is like all of DEI. <laughs> like if you want to know the heart of DEI, it's this slide. You don't have to know all of the most woke terms. You don't have to know all of the ways in which you can commit microaggressions. If you can simply use your power to connect, heal and repair relationships in your organization to empower all members in your organization and in your community, you will be an inclusive and equitable leader. This is the heart of leading during polarizing times and building bridges across difference, right? It doesn't mean not holding people accountable, but it means holding them accountable with dignity, right? And using power in this way. When you wanna use power inclusively and equitably and lead during polarizing times, you need to be able to engage in conflict confidence, right? Um, the other behavior that we see amongst nonprofit leaders is a real conflict avoidance. Uh, there's some belief that because we're doing good work, like this, you know, people are really afraid to surface conflict and they avoid it. And it actually leads to a, it, it erodes trust because people are not saying what they're thinking. People are not speaking up for themselves. Our team is actually working on a blog post right now about conflict competence and people pleasing. Uh, and so if you sign up for our newsletter, we'll be sending that out in the next month or so. But conflict competence is being able to engage productively despite differences, conflicts, and disagreements. It includes the ability to raise controversial topics, have difficult conversations, hold people accountable, deliver straightforward feedback, and intervene appropriately when interpersonal difficulties and conflicts arise. This is a core skill for leading during polarizing times because what we're saying with polarizing times is that people are in, are in disagreement. And I don't mean conflict like people are yelling and shouting. I just mean like there's a difference of opinion, a difference of principles and values, a difference of, um, uh, of how we do things. And those things have to be talked through. And that's what's needed to lead during these times. So that's a lot. <laughs> uh, even though it was three things, I admit that it was a lot. And um, the question becomes, how do we make this sustainable for you, right? Uh, it's a big world. 
there's a lot wrong with it right now. Uh, and so how do we create some boundaries to protect you so that you can grow as a leader into the type of leader you want to be that can be impactful in such a polarizing time? So uh, this is just my, my closing thought around this is to understand fundamentally what is in your sphere of control. So this is a, we call this, we've nicknamed this the spheres of reality uh, sometimes, but in, you know, as you go through your life, there are, there is your sphere of concern, things that impact you, but you have no control or influence over like the market, a global pandemic. Uh, if you're not working in, you know, the halls of power, we, you probably have no control over wars and violence and state sanctioned violence. You, there is your sphere of influence, what you can influence, but you can't control the outcome. That's other people's perceptions, other people's opinions, how other people vote. You could influence it, but you can't control it, right? And then there is what you control. And that's fundamentally your actions, your decisions, your behaviors, your words. Everything that I've talked about in this presentation Values-based communication, being transparent, using your power wisely, those are within your sphere of control as a leader. You have full ability to control those things, right? And I'll just leave you with the fact that I, I read recently that um, when we talk about time travel, we are obsessed with the butterfly effect. And if we were to go back in, you know, back in time, Let's not, like some small thing might completely alter our present. What we don't, what we fail to realize is that, you know, we should be using the butterfly effect for now to impact our future. Meaning some small thing might radically change our future, right? And you operating within this fear of control with integrity, with the awareness of these three behaviors of fostering trust, could have a radical impact on the future of your organization, the future of your career, the future of our society, and the future of the world. So we are going to open up the Q&A. So start typing in your questions. And I believe you can also raise your hand and the webinar moderators can unmute you. Uh, while you're typing your questions, I just want to say that um, please feel free to stay in touch. You can sign up for our newsletter at Brevity and Wit. I am the only minimal paya on the entire internet, so you can find me on LinkedIn and connect with me there. I also wanted to say that my publisher is giving a 20% discount to people who have attended this webinar. This is if you buy the book through my publisher, which is at bkconnection.com, and you type in the code June when you're going through the cart. Uh, the code is valid, I think, for the next 30 days until July 25th, and so you can get 20% off my book. There's also, an, um, when you buy the book, there's also an accompanying website with downloadable resources and videos and things like that that you can check out. And so now let us take questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Monko, who's going to help me manage this, right? Yes, that's correct. So we'll both be taking um, questions uh, through the Q&A box, as Minel said. So feel free to continue to type there. And if you have questions that you prefer to ask verbally, feel free to use the raise your hand icon and we will um, get to you in turn. So thanks so much. Okay. Looks like there are a few questions in the chat. If you could yeah. see those. I'm also happy to read them to you. Um, yeah, sure. Should we start with the question? So um, for, I think it's, am I pronouncing this right? Brigid? Bridget? I want to say, I'm not sure if it's a hard G or a soft G, but uh, you said immunity change on an individual and org level is real. How do you handle this? Yeah, um, most people don't like change. Uh, like that, that's a reality. Um, there are very few people I think that like change. Uh, the techniques are varied depending on why there is resistance. When there is resistance to change, you should pause and be willing to consider if there might be a very good reason for it. 
right? People might have a very good reason to be re resistant, or they may just, you know, lack the adequate direction in order to change. There's a wonderful book called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard by Chris Chip and Dan Heath. Uh, Dan Heath actually endorsed my book because I used some of his work in my book uh, that talks about how to actually condition people for change. So I would uh, advise you to check that out. There's also a short video on the equitybook.com website that highlights that switch model of how to get people to change when they're resistance to ch resistant to change. Uh, and then I'm going to take uh, some, so someone else has put in, can you, thank you for your definition and thoughts about transparency. Can you share any experiences about those who have embraced it and any outcomes as a result? Um, well, I can share like a person, like I've personally embraced it. So at Brevity and Wit, we have 100% pay transparency. Um, and earlier on, and we, part of our mission in our dedication to equity is um, instead of having salaried employees and deciding what benefits people should have, we understand that people's lives are different and they need to use their money in different ways. And so it makes more sense to just put more money in the pockets of the people who work with us rather than um, deciding what whether they should have health insurance or life insurance or childcare or whatever it is they need. So in order to put more money in their pockets, we give them a much bigger percentage of their billable rate. It uh, can vary from 60 to 70%. Most DEI firms give 30%. Most uh, graphic design firms give 50%. So we're double, almost double that. Um, However, when we started, it was actually 80%. <laughs> and I realized that I couldn't meet overheads and cover our insurance if we kept it at that. So I had to be really transparent about why we were changing it. And, um, you know, I think I announced in the middle of the summer and we didn't change it until January of the next year. So I gave people time uh, and I socialized it. There was no backlash. Nobody left our team because of it. They understood why it was happening. They understood that like they saw me sweat. They saw how much I was hustling to get work for people, right? Um, and so I think it actually can work, but you know, it also, like I said, it it needs um I I was strategic and thoughtful about what I communicated. It, transparency doesn't isn't like you start treating your staff like your therapist where you tell them everything right I didn't tell them all of my feelings around it or everything I was going through I was very careful about what I shared with them so that they would understand the reasoning for the decision so I hope that answers your question um okay let me see so we have a couple of other questions Manga, do you think any of them? Um... Looks like there is a question about um, allyship. Yeah. And so speaking from a leader um, who might be white, maybe especially a white woman, who how do you balance the, you know, their role in this with also yeah. the potential damage that can can unintentionally cause times? Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. So that's, I think, where that group identity wheel can be very powerful because what white women realize when they fill that out is that they are very conscious of their identity as women because that's how they've been marginalized and very unaware of their identity as a white person because that's how they've been centered. And we talk about how, you know, I talked about how the brain is, um, the brain has evolved to scan for threats and those threats are based on your identity, right? And so often when white women work with women of color, they think that they can bond. Um, Robert Putnam has these two ideas, bonding and bridging, right? That like you bond with somebody who's like you and you bridge with somebody who's different from you. And I think white women often think with women of color that they're bonding over their shared experience of being a woman. But for women of color, they're bridging over this different experience on race and color, right? And so I think um, being able to understand yourself in both your marginalization and your privilege is important. I often say that you're really not ready to do DEI work until you can speak about your marginalization and your privilege in the same breath, right? 
I can own that I'm a woman of color and that I'm heterosexual and that I, you know, I'm neurotypical and that I'm highly educated and, and that I'm like from this very small community in India, which makes me marginalized, but even within the Indian community, I can own all of that and I can understand myself and how people perceive me and interact with me based on that complexity. I mean, I, I won't go into it, but like my interactions with the Indian community are really varied because like a lot of the um, South Asia, a lot of the Indians in high level positions and organizations are Brahmins and upper caste, and I am not. And so there's a subtlety there that somebody who's not Indian may not pick up on, right? And so I know how I'm being marginalized and how, but then I also know as an Indian woman, we are the most affluent minority in this country, the aff most affluent racial minority. And there are ways in which I'm being privileged in a conversation and in a room that a black woman is not. And I'm aware of that too, right? So I think for white women, they have to get out of just thinking of themselves as either a woman or a white person and understand themselves in all of that complexity and understand that all of that stuff is happening at the same time. Right, it really shows how intersectionality and I of identities really plays in very much. Thank you. Yeah. For that. Um, Looks like we have another question um, when talking about DEI and equity and identity and, you know, people acknowledging different power um, and different identities have different power and different roles. How do you um, navigate um, talking about that, engaging that, respecting that um, without, um, you know, or, or how can leaders talk about it or engage with it without it being such an extractive process? And how would you coach um, a leader through that? Through talking about their own identity? I think so, in terms of um, extractive behavior, maybe unintentionally yeah. sort of. Yeah. Um, this came up actually recently with a, with a client who was asking about um, pronouns. And they really wanted to um, address pronoun usage. And they were wondering how to do that. Like, do they just like go around and have everybody introduce themselves with their pronouns? And, and I asked like, well, what's the context of this, right? And um, one of the people on our staff uh, said, you know, well, you know, the, the, the way to do it is that getting cisgender people to start by saying, you know, I use she, her pronouns. Right. That's how you can create an environment where a trans or a non-binary person might be comfortable saying it. But I also brought up that, like, you shouldn't be forcing anybody to offer up their pronouns, because basically then what you're doing is you're outing them. You don't like, it, it, you know, particularly if this is like a call with a client, like or a sales call, like you don't know what the culture is in their organization, what that would mean for them. Um if it's a language barrier and you're talking to somebody like my mother, like she would be like, what do you, what do you mean pronouns? So now you're making somebody feel dumb. Um, the point of DEI is to make people feel safe enough to share what's salient to them. It is not to out people or to make people feel stupid, right? It is also not to get everybody to behave in like one particular way, right? And so, what, and, and one of our other consultants said, you know, yeah, like in this question about pronouns, who are they centering? Are they centering trans people who might feel marginalized or are they centering themselves and virtue signaling that they're up on the most like woke thing, right? And so if you really wanna like, the way to avoid extractive behavior is to constantly remind yourself that the point is not to center yourself. The point is to center the people who um, are pushed to the margins. And that means sort of sit, like taking a step back, creating an environment, but then letting things unfold as they unfold and not trying to control it. And if somebody doesn't share their pronouns, that's fine. If you don't make a land acknowledgement, that's fine. That doesn't mean that you're bad to indigenous people, right? Like, it's okay to like, you know, like I often don't speak my pronouns, but, and I don't have them here because we're on a webinar, but I often have it in my Zoom handle, like what my pronouns are. And so it's a subtle way to signal, I'm cool with this. 
I also don't need to say, like say this out loud because it's not about me and I don't need to take up more airtime, right? So there are ways to do that. What that requires is humility, which um, is in short supply these days. Like not everybody's there yet. It takes a while. Um, but, um, but I would just ask yourself, who are you centering in in what you're doing? Yeah. It's really good, really. The people that you're holding at the fore. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and maybe related to that, you mentioned um, during your presentation that sometimes the sort of designated leader, the ED, the CEO, whomever, uh, might not necessarily be the best person to deliver a specific message, and it might be a moment for them to step back. Um, how do you approach that in terms of, you know, the actual situation and, and how to gracefully um, and intentionally step back? And then also maybe to the other side of that, how do you sort of tap the person to deliver the message? And whereas perhaps that person, you know, because of their identity might be the better person to deliver it, but they might be holding, you know, kind of being the representative for their, uh, whatever that identity is. So how do you balance, you know, sort of that stepping back and also allowing someone else to engage, but then not making it be a burden for that person as well? Yeah, well, I, I think, the way to do it with a leader is actually it starts a lot sooner by doing like sort of strengths based leadership development, figuring out what the leader's strengths are and allowing them to play to their strengths. And and I think sometimes this is missed about di diversity and inclusion work. The real beauty of DEI is that you no longer have to be all things to all people. If you're willing to build a diverse team, if you're willing to be inclusive, it lets you off the hook from having to be perfect in all things to all people. And somebody's asking about like, what do you do about chronically burnt out nonprofit EDs? You distribute the work. You stop asking them to do all of it and you, you allocate it across a diverse team. Now that requires that that team um, is aligned knows how to be a healthy functioning team. So those are the things you have to work on first before you can get to this thing, to this part of like distributing it, right? Um, the, the other thing to do is, you know, and, and part of that leadership development is that leaders should always be thinking about communications. And, and that strengths-based leadership is like, what is the thing that I'm, I would be strongest at addressing? And then who are the other players in our space? Maybe it's not a staff member that you go to. Maybe it's another strategic partner in the space who would have more authority to speak about something, right? So you got to think much, like, much more strategically about how you're engaging everyone. That's what a good leader does. A good leader isn't the mouthpiece. That's your spokesperson. A good leader knows how to strategically pull on people's strengths to accomplish something. That's fantastic. That's really, I think, such a salient point, quite frankly, <laughs> to, to kind of end on. Um, and I know I think that there's so much more to unpack and to, to dialogue. Um, so I know we could continue this, but unfortunately we are at time. Um, so just wanted to thank you, Minnell, again, for, for joining us and for sharing just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and we hope that uh, you all in the audience had um, just as much of a learning time as us. And thank you for being here as well.